I need some traction. Hey folks, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Traction and Boast AI. Today's Traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI and Launch Academy in partnership with Growth Blazers. As you're joining, hit everyone in the chat and introduce yourself. Tell us where you're tuning in from. I'm tuning in from Austin. Andrew said he's tuning in from San Mateo, which is right across the bridge from where I lived. I lived in Castro Valley, very close to Dublin, Pleasanton. Nice. And yeah, so I lived there for almost 12 years. So folks, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat from Dallas, Texas. We usually get a very international audience all the way from Vancouver to Dubai. So let's see what the makeup here is today. Oh, wow. Awesome. What's going on, everybody? Indonesia, India, you have a lot of fanboys from all over the world. Philadelphia, London, Ontario, Columbus, Ohio, Vancouver, Seattle. Fantastic. Great, great session here today. The art of buying, building, growing, and selling non-venture scale cash flow positive companies with stable growth is a growing trend in the startup world. And, uh, you know, people call it micro PE. But Andrew here is the champ of the game, serial entrepreneur, CEO of Micro Acquire, and he's going to give us his detailed playbook. Andrew is a four-time founder with three exits, also a former CRO. He founded business apps as a broke 20-something entrepreneur and sold it to a PE firm, private equity firm, before the age of 30. After going head-to-head -head with Apple over a blanket app store policy that threatened to ruin him. And Andrew, you might be following him on LinkedIn. I certainly do. He has a lot of great content. Plus, he's been featured on New York Times, Forbes, Wall Street Journal, and Entrepreneur. So super, super excited to have you here. How are you doing today? Doing great. And uh, thanks for everybody for the kind words and the, the comments. Um, appreciate each and every one of you. And hopefully I can give you some good tips. But yeah, excited. Thanks for having me. Definitely. People from Israel, India, all over. So you've had a super successful career, four-time entrepreneur, three exits, former CRO. Give us your backstory all the way from being this broke 20-something entrepreneur to micro acquire. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I've had a very fortunate career in terms of uh, the opportunities that have been given to me. So uh, I've been an entrepreneur kind of my whole life. Um, I was born in Detroit, uh, moved to Southern California when I was um, around five. Um, dad passed away when I was early. So growing up for me, it was kind of rough. Um, that's kind of how I entered entrepreneurship. It wasn't, hey, this like I'm going to Stanford and I want to do a start. It was more like, you know, I got to hustle to, um, you know, make money. Um, so I started off with like an eBay store. I sold some embarrassing facts. Like I had a World of Warcraft affiliate website. If anyone's familiar with that game, uh, you're a nerd, um, just like me. Uh, and I had, uh, what else? Um, just did a lot of, um, you know, things online to, you know, generate just some sort of money in junior high and high school. And uh, really just kind of learned entrepreneurship just through practice. And I feel really grateful for that because I learned very early that business was my passion. And I'm a huge believer that when you find your passion, uh, you're going to be really good at it uh, because it becomes like a sport. And so every, so then I went to CSU Chico. Um, I somehow got in with like a 2.2 GPA. I was definitely never a uh, call it or a classroom learner. Um, it was off like SAT scores. I was a decent test taker, but, um, as soon as I went to CSU Chico, I knew I wanted to start a business. So I basically kind of had this like mindset where I had four years to figure everything out. Um, and I used that time where every summer I'd start a new business and, you know, when we talk about um, three exits, one of them was in college and it, it was a little one. And this is kind of where my entrepreneurial career really started. Um, I basically, I'm, I'm not technical. Um, I'd say my strengths are brand, storytelling, sales, marketing. Um, I think I'm a decent leader. I don't know. You have to ask my team that. Uh, but I bought a script that was basically like a job board clone 
and I niche it to um, iPhone applications. So this is when the iPhone first came out. And so uh, when I say, you know, success in my career, a big part of it candidly is just luck. I, you know, was in the right place at the right time, but, you know, a big part of entrepreneurship is creating your own luck. And so I had this kind of unique insight into mobile applications where this job board, all it did was connect um, iPhone developers with businesses. And I spent like a whole semester, like skipping class, just commenting on every single blog that had to do with iPhone apps. Just saying, if you have an iPhone app idea, go to this job board and you can find developers. And I noticed a trend where uh, specifically high-end restaurants and high-end hotels were paying like $100,000 for an iOS app. And this was before Android. This is how um, early I was with mobile. But I, I saw mobile and I was like, that's like, I got to get in on that. So I, I jumped on that. Um, and I just thought to myself, okay, so these businesses keep asking for kind of the same application, like a loyalty program, push notifications. There's these do-yourself website builders what if there was like a do-yourself mobile app builder for small businesses? And so I uh, sold that business uh, to a person named Vladimir. I can't, the details, it was, this was, geez, like 15 years ago. Um, so I'm 33 now. That was when I was maybe 20. Um, and uh, sold that for, let's call it like 50 K or something like that. But at the time it felt like a trillion billion dollars because everyone's broke in college. But uh, the reason I sold it was, you know, I thought if I could just make a template that I could customize and sell to local businesses and have a price point that's much cheaper than a custom app, um, I could have a decent business. And my only goal was to just not get a job just to, you know, allow myself to keep working on different business ideas until one really took off. But this one was the one that really took off. And this company that I'm describing is, is Business Apps, which is, is still up. It's spelled B-I-Z-N-E-S-S-Apps.com. And it's a drag and drop, um, no code, um, mobile app builder. And uh, yeah, the way it started was very humble beginnings. Um, again, this is before Android. We almost made a BlackBerry app. I'm glad we didn't do that. Um, and uh, started the business with me just cold calling, you know, restaurants, um, you know, uh, signing up pretty much every business in my college town, which was kind of like the perfect, you know, incubation area for that type of business because college students, you know, local businesses looking to connect with them, uh, you know, they would send out a push note like happy hour or we're doing a discount for lunch today or something like that. Um, and college students, you know, were heavy users of mobile applications and then, yeah, ran that business for, ended up raising a hundred thousand dollars for that business. Um, uh, grew it to about, um, 10 million in annual recurring revenue and then sold it to a private equity firm when I was, uh, 29. And that was kind of my first sort of like, whoa, uh, my life's going to be a little different after this. And, uh, I did not expect that to happen. Um, so I'm super grateful, but yeah, it, that business was like a right place, right time business. But, um, again, going back, like, you know, as an entrepreneur, you gotta, you know, what was, um, what I always say is you want to make a, you want to look at a market that is not obvious to everyone today, but will become obvious over time. And I had these unique insights into, you know, people like businesses are going to want to know how to build mobile applications, but it was really hard. It was really complex, really expensive. And so we made it faster, easier, and cheaper. So I made a non-obvious bet on something I thought would become obvious over time. And I was right. Um, in hindsight, you know, it was very obvious being, you know, everyone has a mobile phone in their pocket and half the people listening are probably looking at their phone. Um, so yeah, that's how I got started. So what are some hacks to finding those non-obvious ideas? Did you develop any that you can recommend? I mean, really, I'd say the biggest hack is just movement, like doing stuff. Like, you know, the way I got the, the unique insights into, you know, business apps, which became my competitive advantage 
You know, what functionality do businesses want? Um, what do they want the app to look like? What do they want? Like, what, what do they want? I had a job board where I was seeing all of this, you know, information firsthand. And so, you know, one easy recommendation I always have for people is if you're thinking of a business idea or something like that, um, start an agency. And then if you start to see a pattern in terms of customer problems, you can automate that into a software product and you have this unique insight because you're talking to these customers every single day. Um, so that's kind of one way, but I mean, yeah, sometimes you got to just have some conviction and believe in yourself. Um, and you're not always going to be right. That's another thing too, is you got to understand that you got to get it wrong to get it right. And there's tons of failures that I've had in terms of my career. Um, but every failure you learn from and, you know, with those learnings, when you go into your next venture, you're more prepared. And then when you come across one that, you know, really has some legs, um, you know, you're, you're more, your chances of success are so much higher because you have that experience. So I'd, I'd say just movement, you know, the more you're in the market, the more you're talking to people, the more you're doing stuff, um, you know, action just has a way of just kind of creating opportunities, at least in my experience. I love that action has a way of creating opportunities and something you said we did at Boast as well. I've been a part of a few venture back companies and Boast, we started doing things manually as you talk to more and more customers, then you figure out what you need to automate, delegate uh, and, and so on. And that's worked extremely well for us. Now, what led you to micro acquire? You had a great success. You could have done in any number of things and seems like micro acquire is one of those things that you're betting on that others, not many are betting on, but what led you to it? Yeah, good question. Um, so a couple few unique insights as well. Um, number one, I'll just start with, I wanted it to exist personally. And for those that aren't familiar with micro acquire, micro acquire is, um, the largest startup acquisition marketplace in the world. Um, we've helped over 500 startups get acquired. We've done about um, over a quarter billion in closed acquisition volume. Um, and that growth to me is like, whoa, I did not expect that. Um, but when I first sold business apps, um, I had a lot of founder friends reach out to me and say like, how did you sell your business? What is due diligence? How'd you find the buyer? What's private equity? What's, and I was like, whoa, like do, okay. So founders know about fundraising, uh, growth, sales, everything but how to sell your business. Um, so I thought there was an opportunity to, and then I looked around the market a little bit and I just saw other marketplaces that were, you know, felt kind of like Craigslist, kind of everything goes. Um, there was nothing specific to SaaS. There was nothing specific to startups, um, you know, profitable software companies. Um, nothing really where, you know, I would list business on. And so I basically built, what I would list one of my prior companies on. It's private. Um, I have control over which buyers see, you know, any sort of sense of information. Um, but yeah, I just thought, you know, entrepreneurship through acquisition was going to be a trend. And so I made a bet on that. Um, I just said, you know, I started hearing about other micro P firms having a lot of success. And I was like, this is going to be a trend you know, you can have a business idea or you can just buy one. Like it's not just Google and Apple and, you know, these large companies doing acquisitions now. Sometimes it's an individual buyer um, or sometimes it's two people with, you know, a small fund. It's So there's been so much growth that's been out of my control. So we're definitely, you know, benefiting from market tailwinds. But um, yeah, I just looked around the market. I saw the the only options to really sell a SaaS business was like through business brokers charging like 15%, which I thought was like highway robbery. So uh, I just kind of said, Hey, what if we just remove the middleman, no fees, completely free to sell your business. Um, and then we'll just charge the buyer for access to the platform. Um, so we basically did the opposite of what everyone was doing in the market because the market was really, from my view, favoring buyers. And we wanted to put entrepreneurs and startups, um, you know, in the best possible position to maximize their exit. So uh, long story short, uh, 
you know, I, I love startups. Um, so when I started thinking of my next startup, um, you know, I wrote down startups and entrepreneurs um, as the customer I wanted to serve. Um, discovery was taken, you know, their investing was taken uh, and acquisitions just felt like a, an area where I had some unique insights and um, yeah. Definitely. Now that's a tough business model, isn't it? Like uh, charging a subscription fee to buyers when the rest of the market is taking a percentage. Tell me more about that. Tell us more about that. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And I've been told it would never work a hundred times and our current business model. So we will eventually have a fee, probably like, you know, three to 5% or something like that. But what we want to do is we want to standardize the acquisition process. We want to make it so easy that it feels like you're buying something off, you know, eBay or something like that. That might be a bad analogy, but um, we want, like right now we're working on a letter of intent builder. We want to innovate on due diligence tools. We want to innovate on uh, tools to transfer the assets, um, all the legal documentation. There's just so much um, acquisitions just going to be so confusing and just getting buyers and sellers on the same page in terms of step-by-step -step process. Um, that's where we want to get to. And that's when we'll probably start charging a commission fee. But um, part of our growth strategy has really just been, you know, let's provide as much value to the market as possible and then focus on, you know, capitalizing on this activity um, later um, to build the brand, to really, you know, prove out that, you know, there is product market fit here. But um, funny story with our current business model. Um, uh, basically, we had uh, one day I just had a few sellers reach out to me and they just said, like, I've had like 50 buyers reach out to me. Who do I focus on? Like, this is just way too many. And so the premium buyer program that we have now, uh, which is just 390 a year, and that allows buyers to contact sellers, then sellers look at their LinkedIn profile, have a short conversation, then give them, give them access to their private details or their uh, data room. Um, I just kind of made that up. I was like, hey, let's just put a paywall up to vet the buyers a little bit. So now as buyers come in, we vet the buyers and we vet the listings. Um, so we're just starting with uh, the this business model now, but over time, we'll definitely expand into commissions um, on each deal. Fantastic, fantastic. So you're, you're a big fan of bootstrapping. You effectively bootstrapped a bunch of businesses what are the benefits of bootstrapping and some tips for building and growing startups with limited resources? Yeah, good question. So first question in terms of, um, you know, the benefits of bootstrapping is you own the whole business. Um, that is, is number one. And that makes a business a hundred times easier to sell. The more people you have involved, like, an example with microcore, we're venture backed to sell the business. You know, there's controls within most venture backed businesses where you need approvals. And the more capital you raise, you have liquidation preferences where you can raise ten million dollars, and then if you get an offer for you know ten million dollars, like all that money is going back to investors. But if you had bootstrapped the business and you get an offer for ten million dollars, and then if you if you you know raise money and you sell for ten million. Uh, it's a complete failure. But if you bootstrap the business and you're able to get it to any sort of profitability, you're kind of at the blackjack table with like, you're in the money. You can cash your chips in whenever you want. And you have full control, full freedom. Um, it's definitely, you know, not as easy as, you know, it doesn't like bootstrapping or venture. They're both just startups in general, incredibly hard to build. But I truly believe for, 99% of entrepreneurs bootstrapping is the way to go because it just, it gives you so much more optionality in terms of an outcome. So I always tell entrepreneurs when they start businesses, um, you know, think of like that. What do you want out of the startup? Do you want to have a lifestyle business? Do you want to you know change a market? Do you want to potentially get acquired for a few million dollars? Like what is your goal? And if you can, outline that before you, you know, start making irreversible decisions, the better. So if you want to, you know, change a market, um, you know, venture capital might be your route, but if your goal is really just, 
you know, start a lifestyle business, um, you know, get acquired for, you know, a couple million dollars, which, which is a lot of money, but not a lot in terms of, you know, um, in, in VC land. Um, so that's, that's kind of the main things. And I bootstrapped um, my first company. Um, and I said no to venture capital a ton. I said, no, because we were in the money, you know, we had a profitable business. It was growing. We didn't have, you know, the pitch was kind of like, well, you can go up market. It could get bigger. And I was so young at the time. I just thought, you know, this is kind of like a for sure thing. If I play my cards, right. Not a for sure, for sure thing, but, um, I was confident we'd have a successful exit. Um, so yeah, it, it just, you know, I'm glad I took, um, that path. And it, again, it wasn't easy, but when it comes to how to scale a bootstrap company, um, the main metric that we looked at at business apps was customer payback period. Um, and we would call ourselves, uh, more of a distribution company than a product company. And I'm happy to expand on that, but, um, we built a business model where basically every customer that came in, we were profitable after 32 days. So, if we kept the customer on for just 32 days, we can reinvest that capital back into the business. And so we had this really fast, um, I can't think of the accounting term off the top of my head, but just the ability to reinvest into the business as quickly as possible. So um, if you're bootstrapping a startup, you need to focus on uh, really capital efficient customer acquisition strategies. And for business apps, we were really heavy on press, really heavy on storytelling, um, even just boring old SEO, boring old SEO can really pay off. Um, if you, you know, are consistent and rank for the terms that your customers are literally typing in to find your product. Um, so that was kind of our main strategy at business apps and, um, worked out pretty well. And then when you were bootstrapping micro acquire, what are two or three things you did to seed it and drive early sort of growth customer acquisition? Oh man. Uh, so micro acquire is like a business for me. Like it's, it's not like, a, it, it's like a video game that I love to play. So I, if you look at the activity, I was managing all of customer support, all product management, all marketing, um, quite literally every part of the business. So it, I would wake up at 4 a.m. I would work to like 10 p.m. I don't recommend this, but sometimes like, you know, a business needs to be willed into existence. So I went on like every podcast I was invited to. Um, uh, my background uh, being in sales, I had a huge like outbound, uh, cold outbound email campaign that like ran automatically. Um, just to create awareness of this marketplace because you need to get both sides. You need supply and demand. So it's this tricky chicken and egg problem and you have to attack it quickly all at once. Um, so basically, I just kind of did everything and every opportunity that came to me. Um, any person that wanted to talk, talk about the business, any person that wanted to have me on their podcast, anyone who wanted to interview me um, related to the business, um, and then I had a big social strategy of just telling a story around, you know, why this business is interesting and how I think, you know, m a is going to be a trend coming up. Um, so yeah, I started even my own podcast. Um, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, I just had a belief that this is a business that needed to exist. And I did everything I could to possibly, you know, um, get it off the ground. And a lot of that is just hard work. There's no silver bullets. Um, there's no magic. Like I did this one thing and it took off. Like it was like a hundred little things that added up. And that's really how most businesses are started is you have an idea and then you iterate on that idea over and over and over and over and over through customer feedback. And, um, that's what I did. And it, it, I look back and I kind of laugh now. I'm like, I can't believe I did that, but, um, it, it was fun. Um, so when you can get to a place where you find a business where it's fun to you, but it's work to someone else. Um, that's a quote from one of my investors. Uh, you know, you have a huge competitive advantage because you're going to go that extra mile to make the business work when, 
uh, your competition, it's work for them. So, you know, they're not going to, so that's, and you'll think about the customer difference. You'll have more empathy for, um, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve and, um, yeah, it helps you push through when the times get hard and any startup you start, you know, it's a bumpy road. So, um, yeah, just kind of everything and everything is the only answer I have. I, I liked what you said there. Sometimes some startups need to be willed into existence and it's not about having like a Mike Tyson, like KO channel. You probably like Floyd May Mayweather throwing a, a lot of jabs and, and punches there and trying a bunch of things. And the other thing you talked about, which, which I drew out was passion. And, and when passion meets profession, you can be that Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan here. Now there's a question here on, what did you look for in a lead investor? One, why did you decide to raise money? And um, what did you look for in that lead investor when you did raise? Yeah, good question. Um, so my lead investor was, uh, his name is Jeremy Levine. So our first financing was with um, Naval, the founder of Angelus, Andreas Klinger, and Jeremy Levine from Bessemer Venture Partners. So I never actually pitched anyone. I never actually had a deck. Um, I had these relationships pre-built and I met Jeremy six, seven years ago, um, at in and out, um, which was kind of funny. Um, and we just kept in touch and, you know, he really saw and kind of opened my eyes to the size of this possible opportunity. And given I had just, you know, I had a win, um, you know, and really I'm not financially motivated. I, thought to myself, you know, I want to make, you know, an impact on thousands of entrepreneurs. Um, let's see how far we can take this. Let's see how, let's see what's really here. Um, and so I'd say that's kind of like another, uh, thing I always recommend with entrepreneurs is kind of stair step in entrepreneurship. Um, I'm kind of sidetracking your question, but I'll answer it like this. Um, you know, my recommended path for entrepreneurs is, you know, first start an agency, just like learn how to build like the basics of a business. Um, and then number two, bootstrap an asset that could be an e-commerce company, a SaaS company to make you financially secure. And then after that, do whatever you want, like raise money, swing for the fences, go lay on a beach, like do a lifestyle business, like whatever your thing was. Um, and Mike required for me, just, you know, again, like you said, my passion and my profession aligned so strongly on this one. I just thought to myself, you know, I want to run this business for the next decade and I want to basically bring in the smartest people to help build it with me and build it with the startup community. So that was the first financing. And then we did two other financing, two other financing. So we raised um, about 11 million in total. Um, and 90% of my investors are entrepreneurs. So, you know, CEOs of companies I admire and corp debt teams of, you know, companies I admire. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to like hear their thoughts on like how big of a problem this is and like how needed this is for the startup community. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely downsides to raising venture capital, like you're, odds of financial success truly do go down in my opinion. Um, but again, not being motivated by my personal success and really just wanting to help entrepreneurs, it, it made a lot of sense to bring on investors. And as you talk to entrepreneurs that are raising, if they, if they want to go on that path, what are the top two or three things you say look for in, a, in an investor? Well, number one, candidly, I tell everyone, don't raise money. Like, just don't. <laughs> I, 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 sir, unless, you know, unless you're at a point where, you know, for me, it's, it's, you know, it's mentally stimulating to think how big can this thing get? And if that's really what your intentions are. So I start with like, what are you trying to get out of this? Like, what a, if you're just trying to build, you know, a medium sized business, um, bootstrap as long as you can, because you can always raise money at, like you don't have to raise money now. You can raise money in a year after you've de-risked the business. You've gotten it to, so when MicroQuire raised money, we had um, already done, uh, I believe a hundred million in acquisitions. Um, we were over a million in revenue um, just from the premium buyer subscriptions. It was just me running the business. So there, there was enough there for me to feel confident. 
Um, so I usually say don't raise money. Um, but if you are going to raise money, um, I always recommend um, relationship for sure, 100%, especially with your lead investors. So, you know, given I had known Jeremy for so long um, and just his track record of, uh, you know, Pinterest, Shopify, Yelp, um, you know, I felt he could bring a lot of knowledge in terms of, you know, how to really make this the best marketplace for acquisitions. Um, but the relationship part is, is crucial um, because if you bring in an investor that you just don't get along with and they, you know, are kind of your, your, your quote unquote boss, um, you know, you're, you're not going to like running the business. And I think the key to going the distance with really any sort of venture bootstrapped or, or not um, bootstrapped or funded is you, you got to set up your company in a way where you enjoy every bit of it. You enjoy the people you work with. You enjoy the problem that you're solving. Um, you enjoy the hard challenges that you have to somehow, you know, overcome. So um, I would say relationship kind of a cop-out answer, but it's, it's so true, especially for the first um, investor that you bring on. Definitely. And, you know, with us at Boast, we build this massive traction community, about 100,000 subscribers. And over time, we built a lot of investor relationships that before we even needed to raise, it just came together. And we had bootstrapped to near eight figures in revenue as well. But, but a question for you, folks who are not super well networked, what are one or two hacks to build those relationships before you even need them? Build in public. Like, yeah. <laughs> Like that was the biggest thing for me was, um, and I, I didn't know. So build in public is, um, uh, it's, it's kind of a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. Um, but it's basically just being very transparent in terms of like, here's my revenue, here's our progress. And you share what's working and you share what's not working. And you kind of, I always say the best brand stories that you can tell is you tell a story that has no ending. And so what I did at microquire in that and how I attracted, you know, a lot of our initial users was, you know, I kind of told the story of microquire, like, look, we just had this company acquired or today we just took live, um, you know, $50 million worth of startups or something like that. Um, so I was constantly talking about like the day-to-day -day activity of microquire. And we, and I drew people into this story uh, where, you know, people were rooting for microquire to succeed um, and th I think that's the biggest hack right there is, you know, just getting people to notice you instead of the other way around, instead of going and trying to chase investors, you know, you create a business to a point where you don't have to necessarily pitch them. Like they want to have calls with you. So you flip the paradigm. Um, and then that's how it, it, all the financing, um, happened at, at microquire the second financing uh, was basically just users of microquire. It was just people that had bought companies, people that had used the product, um, that were excited about kind of like what this vision or what this company could become. Um, and a lot of them found me on like Twitter or LinkedIn. I'd never met them in person. Um, so I'd say build in public, um, and just, you know, really telling your founder story, like anywhere you possibly can. Um, and that goes back into like, you know, willing the business into existence. And another comment I'll make is, uh, you know, I'm, I always think that, you know, when you look at a business, you'll see five direct competitors, but in reality, most startups competitor is just customer attention. There's a hundred million plus startups right now. So any way you can find to stand out and really get people you know, pull it into your story and you consistently tell that story over time, um, you'll just bump into people and you just make these, again, it's like, you know, action creates opportunity. And I think when you put yourself out there like that, it surprises people and they want to talk to you and you just kind of never know where those relationships might go. Um, so I'd say build in public. Yeah, and I've seen you be very transparent on LinkedIn and Twitter, and I've also watched your following over the years go from thousands to tens of thousands. And you really have this knack for drawing people into your story and micro acquire story. What are some tips for people to become better storytellers? 
It's a good question. I would say um, the first one is just understanding that every everyone has a story. Um, it could be, and it's all about like finding like your angle. So, um, you know, the story with microquire is really just, you know, my background with going through acquisitions, um, looking at the current marketplace, seeing zero innovation, um, seeing startups, you know, kind of being borderline ripped off by current options to sell their business. Um, and I wanted to put a stop to that and help startups, um, again, maximize their exits without these crazy fees. And that really resonated within the marketplace. Like, let's take out the middleman um, and have a free and open marketplace. Let's democratize startup acquisitions. Um, but it could be, you know, you want to talk about things like, why did you start the company? Like, what problem, like, what drew, what drew you to this problem? Um is there, you know, a Goliath in your industry where you can have kind of a David versus Goliath story that we did that at business apps where we would tell a story to small businesses during our sales process where we kind of paint a picture of like, hey, you know, Starbucks down the street, they have a mobile app and they spell, they spend $2 million on it. And we can give you that same experience, but for the price of a newspaper ad, like we want to help you compete with mega brands um, without you know, spending money that, you know, you don't have, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we had this like David versus Goliath story of like, you can compete against franchises um, by utilizing our product. And we told it better than that. I totally I didn't sit, tell the, the pitch as good as I could have, but you get the idea of maybe there's a Goliath in the market where you can kind of call them out. Like, Hey, um, you know, you've been doing this for so long. We don't like, we have a different stance. And you basically kind of like brand an enemy where you have people create or pick a side um, in the market. And some examples I'll, I'll bring up from other companies would be, you know, when Salesforce launched, like their big story was on-premise software. They were like, no software, like hashtag, no software. Um, this was when like, um, you know, you would go into an office and software was installed on computers and they were the first to you know, put software in a web browser and they started SaaS as a category. Another great company would be Drift. And what they really recognized was, you know, uh, customers want information immediately. They don't want to fill out an ebook and then, or a form and then get an ebook and then have a account executive reach out to them to talk about their product. Um, and so they had a sort of, um, they branded an enemy of no forms. Um, so I think, and then with micro it was brokers and then with business apps, it was um, small business versus big business. So there's a lot of different, you know, angles, but I think you want to do one that is, is really true to you and one that you truly believe in, because the more authentic your story is, the more it's going to resonate with people. Because if you tell a story that you don't really kind of believe in, um, you know, 90% of what you say is in your tone. And so and then it just gets exhausting of just, you know, if, if you think one thing, but you're saying another thing, you know, it just gets tiring. So just being authentic um, and being creative too, and always testing, you know, the start, the story that you start out with doesn't have to be the story that you stick with throughout your whole company's um, history. So you can, you know, test and iterate like multiple different variations of your story. But I think just, you know, the founding story is really the key. Why did you start it? Why you? Um, is what Basically, what is the founder market fit? Why you? Why are you the founder to really solve this problem? Definitely. And the other thing that uh, I see with you is consistency, right? You're showing up day in, day out. You're putting out content. And you're sharing stories of not only your journey as a founder, but journeys of thousands of people that build, scale, and sell on micro acquire. And that resonates with people. People connect with people. And those stories I see working, getting hundreds of likes, tens of thousands of engagements, and, uh, and a lot of brand for you. Now, let's switch gears for a second here. Acquiring a startup. You've helped thousands of SaaS companies grow and get acquired. How do you estimate the value of a SaaS startup in this day and age and ties to a question here around the state of the market 
and you know average ARR valuations, types of buyers. Perhaps you can shed some light on that. Yeah, that. Uh, let me pull up the question. Um, I can't find it, but I'll just kind of answer that. Um, so valuing a startup, it's hard. Um, you know. My least favorite question is like, hey, I have a SaaS company doing a million in revenue. What is it worth? Is it a Ferrari? Is it a Corolla? Is it an old Corolla? Is it a moped? Like, what is it? Um, you know, there's so much variability. Like, are you developing like really, really valuable IP? Do you have real, do you have five-year contracts with like enterprise customers? Um, are you SMB? Do you have super high churn? Um, did you just start this business like six months ago? Is it like a, a stable business? Um, how removed from you are are how removed are you from the business as a founder? Is it automated? All those factors, you know, really can you know sway your valuation quite a bit. Um, but generally, you know, rule of thumb, um, I always tell tell founders to you know think around. Um, on microquire, we see ranges from three to eight times um, trailing 12 months profit. So a lot of the buyers that we work with on microquire are um, financial buyers. So they're looking for profitable businesses, not ones that are VC backed, that are you know bleeding cash, that you know need a soft landing because those deals require um, you know uh, approval from the VC firm and then approval from the members um, of the VC firm. And then maybe there's a second VC firm and there's a, a an angel investors, like let's use this like boutique investment bank. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're profitable, um, you can use a multiple on uh, profits or if you're just running, like when I sold business apps, um, we were barely profitable, but we were basically running the business at break even. So that's where you put just a uh, multiple on your, annual recurring revenue. And right now we're seeing like two to five. Um, we see outliers, you know, we see like, we've seen as high as like 10 and stuff like that, but those are kind of the ranges. And if you want to get more information, um, go to microquire.com and then click resources. And we just released um, a full, basically like uh, valuation guide of all the acquisitions that we've seen and kind of the averages based on whether you're an e-commerce startup, a SaaS business, um, even marketplaces and a number of other agencies as, as well. Um, so I'd definitely check it's, but that's a hard question to answer without like specifics. So, you know, what does the business do? How valuable is the customer set? You know, what does churn look like? What are the growth opportunities? How long has it been in business? Um, you know, the, the, the list can go on. Um, but the I, rules I, of the the rules of the game probably are similar in that if you want to command top valuation, then you need to have best in class NRR, best in class growth rate, um, and churn kind of thing. You just got you got to have a great business. I mean, that's if you want to get acquired, and I I kind of laugh when I see like this is like the framework of getting acquired, and and it's important. Like you want to be prepared, you want to understand. Um, and there's a ton of resources on microquare. We talk about due diligence, the legal steps, how to create a data room, what to put in it, um, what financial metrics do buyers want to see, due diligence checklist. Um, so you can prepare all of that in advance. But the number one thing really at the end of the day is just having a good quality business with happy customers. If you get that right, um, generally everything else kind of takes care of itself. Definitely. Now, I mean, that ties to this question here, which, which says, what are the things a startup should keep in mind to position themselves for an acquisition from the beginning? Uh, I would say documentation of everything. Uh, the more you can show. So when you meet with buyers, you know, they're going to have a list, a large list of questions. Like due diligence is basically like getting audited by the IRS multiplied times like 100. Depending on the buyer, some buyers um, are a little loose with due diligence. Um, the buyer I sold to was very like, we basically locked our exec team in a room for like two months um, and went through a ton of stuff. Um, but, you know, going through that, 
thinking back, um, you know, keep track of all your NDAs, keep track of all your customer contracts, um, have a, you know, a proper P and L at all times, um, ideally up to three years, if you're in business for that long. Um, again, just understanding like the process of an acquisition, um, in advance can be huge. So when you, when you do get a reach out, you know, you know, I always say, you know, when you get a reach out from a buyer for you, it could be a life-changing event, but for the buyer, it's, it's Tuesday, you know, like, so you want to educate yourself as much as possible on, you know, how acquisitions work. Um, what are yellow flags that, you know, buyers look for? Um, how can you best position your startup? And sometimes, you know, the best way to position your startup is, you know, showing the warts and all like showing like growth opportunities. Like when I sold business apps, you know, a big part of our conversation was, you know, opportunities that we hadn't yet capitalized on. So we didn't present a perfect business. Like this is perfect. Like every we've, we've exhausted every sort of growth channel. We were like, these are five like huge opportunities that we haven't explored that if you buy this business and you execute on, you know, you can grow the business and they did. And they, they were successful um, post acquisition, but um, you know, sharing those candidly, like oh, we didn't do a good job here, but maybe you have more expertise. Um I could go on and on on that, but um, showing growth opportunities. But I guess the theme I'm getting at here is um, being prepared, being honest, um, and then being um, you know honest with yourself about you know why do you want to sell the business? Um, you know what is your ideal outcome? What does that look like? Um, and being able to articulate that with buyers, um, you know, just saves a lot of time. Is there like two or three key pieces of documentation that uh, buyers typically ask for or get hung up on? Uh, entrepreneurs don't do it right. Uh, P and L for sure. Uh, like a proper, like just get someone to you know go through all of your expenses, all of your uh, revenue, um, all the services. Just a good, healthy financial snapshot of your business. Like that alone can save a ton of time. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd just leave it at that one point, just a clean, healthy p &L. And I, with MicroQuire, we're building tools to automate the process of creating a p &L. Those are some things that, you know, we want to do to make startup acquisitions easier for startups. But that's the number one thing I see is like a lot of startups don't have like a, a p l with, you know, three years of, you know, historical um, financial metrics, expenses, what services do you use? What are you paying for? Who's on staff? Just, and it doesn't have to be like you're giving away your secret sauce. It's just, you know, kind of a high level financial view of your business. Like, is it growing? Is it declining? Is it flat? Um, what is your churn? Uh, what is your customer acquisition cost? Um, where are you spending most and um, where are you spending to acquire customers? Um, those are all very common questions that almost every single buyer will ask. So that alone, I think um, I'd, I'd, I'd use it as number one and number two, and just a, a good, clean p &L. Definitely. And how, how important is, one, your financial model looking into the future next two, three, five years? And then second, your customer file, if you're SaaS by, by cohort to see if they're growing, shrinking, staying flat? kind of thing. Do people ask for that on micro acquire? Um, so the thing with acquisitions that I think a lot of people don't understand is, um, you know, when you go to sell your business, um, you're really being valued on current execution. So what have you accomplished today? So your projections don't matter. Like, like don't even share them. Like you, you can discuss them. Like we think we can hit these, but you might run into a trap of, okay, well, we'll talk in three months and see if you actually hit these projections. And if you do, then you kind of get into a situation where um, the business is more valuable each month. But generally buyers are looking at what have you accomplished up until this date? And that's how you're going to be valuing the business and not future projections. Um, and then, you know, in, in venture, you know, the way you get these huge valuations is, you know, investors are betting on, you know, future potential execution. Um, so that's a big, big difference. Um, 
What was the second question? Sorry. On the on the customer file, like cohort analysis of existing customers over years to you know see if they're growing, shrinking, churning, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, if your business is growing, you can command a much higher multiple um, compared to if it's flat or if it's shrinking. Um, and that's what a lot of buyers look for is they want to buy healthy businesses. And if you're flat, you can still sell a flat business and you can sell a declining business, but the multiples change dramatically. Like if you're growing, you know, two, three, 400% year over year. And even if you're, oh, excuse me, if you're at, um, you know, 2 million in revenue, your multiple will be so much higher than if you were flat at 2 million. And then your the amount of buyers interested, like if that went on micro require, you're gonna be reached out by like celebrities, like private equity groups, like corp dev teams, public companies, like growth really is kind of like um it just shows the business like has a lot of room to to run. Um and buyers love to see that. So absolutely what is yes. What is the growth number? Is there like a magic number? Is it uh, is it rule of forty? Is it fifty? It depends on the business and it depends on the buyer. I mean, a lot of if you're a profitable business, um, you know, you're taking profit out of the business, so you're not going to be growing as fast as like a break even business or a business that's losing money because you're investing so much into growth. So it's a different conversation. So it it just depends. Um, I know that's not the best answer, but um, like if you're extremely profitable and you're still growing like 20% year over year, 20, 30%, that's a, that's a good, healthy business. But if, but then you can have conversations of if we took this profit and we reinvested in growth, we think we can get it to like 50% or something like that. You know, that's a more realistic conversation. Um, so I would say it, it, it depends on the buyer. Like some buyers are looking for high growth, um, startups that have, you know, clear opportunities to take this from, you know, X, Y, Z in revenue and 10 exit. And then other buyers are comfortable with just really stable, profitable software companies. So there's such a wide group of buyers looking for, you know, different types of startups in different scenarios. Um, you know, there's no perfect answer there, but um, yeah, it definitely has, has an effect for sure. Definitely. I like, I like that growing business uh, at break even versus a profitable business. And uh, if you're 20, 30%, what if you could reinvest that back into the company? But as a startup, how do you think about balancing growth versus profitability, right? In the VC world, it's all about growth and profitability is rare. How should founders think about it? Um, I think it just depends on like your, your personal goals. I mean, if you're, if you're pulling out profits from the business, you know, I assume you're, you're paying yourself that as your salary. Um, when I ran business apps, I had a salary, but I ran the business where we were, we were extremely profitable for the first three years. And then we had, you know, a couple million in the bank that we use as like a rainy day fund. And then I ran the business break even for like six years after that. Um, so that was, I was always pushing the, the pedal for growth. Um, I like to grow businesses, um, and not saying you can't grow a profitable business, but the more you invest in growth and what's working and double down on the things that are really moving the needle at your business, the better. Um, so I would say it's more of a, a personal question. Like, um, you know, it's, it's definitely when you run a break, even, you know, when I went into due diligence, you know, obviously we went through a bunch of line items of stuff that, you know, we probably don't need things that we can reduce um, to make the business profitable if they chose to. So that was another option. Um, but I always recommend when you first start the business, run the business at break even for as long as possible or take as little as as little as possible out of the business and reinvest everything into growth to capitalize on opportunity. And then once you get some altitude where you feel like you're at a point where maybe the business can't be ki killed, it pays your bills, you can run this business full time, then you could start thinking about maybe pulling back on growth and you'll find areas of growth start to get saturated where the return on investment in terms of your spend go down. And so you can pull that back a little bit. But um, like with microquire as a real example, I put everything back into growth. Every, and I still do. 
Um, and there's probably areas that we can pull back to reach profitability, but, um, you know, we're, we're looking to really, you know, reshape this market. So we're going to keep investing into growth. So, um, yeah, I mean, cop out answer, but it's, you know, kind of a, kind of a personal question. Like, what are you trying to achieve? Definitely. Now, some questions here, which ties to the next theme, which is walk us through that whole negotiation legal process. You know, uh, people see earnouts, people see mandatory transition periods. What is the ideal scenario for founders and, and what are some tips for negotiating a deal on your terms? Yeah. Um, well, there's a saying, if you have one buyer, you have no buyers. So you want to bring as many buyers to the table as possible. And that's, I think, what really helps with micro require is you get in front of over a hundred thousand buyers, like immediately. And so that gives you leverage with other buyers to negotiate on price or terms or both. Um, when I sold business apps, the terms that I negotiated um, were, were pretty strong. We did all cash. We did um, a stock purchase. So that allowed me to benefit from QSBS. Um, we also asked them to buy the cash on hand, which is kind of a clever um, deal structure where uh, if they buy the cash, you pay uh, basically just state taxes on it instead of federal. Or if you dividended out, you're taxed at 40%. And instead we were taxed at um, 13% on um, the 2 million cash on hand that we had when we sold the business. And then I negotiated in a 90 day transition period for me to leave the business to start working on another startup. So that's what I was looking for. I wanted to leave the business. I'd been in it for eight years and a year in startups is like dog years. It felt like a hundred years. So I was, <laughs> I was ready to move on, but um, leverage, um, you know, creating basically a process where, you know, when you go to the, the table with other buyers, you know, you have, um, you know, a plan in place, um, you have all your materials ready, um, giving yourself as much, you know, negotiation power as, as you can, but good terms. Um, like what we see a lot of micro require is all cash, like quick due diligence, um, being able to leave the company quickly. Um, but as your company gets bigger, you know, you can expect like an earn out, like, because they need you to bring that business into, and it also depends on who you're selling to. So if you're selling to a strategic organization, so strategic buyers would be basically other businesses. Private equity is a financial buyer. So they're more loose in terms of, you know, we'll absorb everything, you know, and then you can leave and then we'll put you on a consulting basis if we need anything. Um, so I would say just outlining like what makes the most sense for you. Um, and then also what makes the most sense with the buyer and then generally trying to meet in the middle. That's usually the best acquisitions is when, you know, both sides are kind of, um, you know, not one side wins all the terms, unless you have a startup that's like Slack and you can command whatever you want. Um, but just being, you know, flexible with terms, um, I think is, is important, but, um, yeah, I mean, just understanding what is important to you and then articulating that to buyers and also have some like non-negotiables. Like I, I knew that I could not work at another company. I would just basically, you know, if I had like a four-year earnout, I'd leave that month too. Like I just knew that about myself and I couldn't do it. So I avoided those, um, those buyers and those offers. And I focused on ones that allowed me to leave the business quickly um, with, uh, no earn out, all cash up front, um, because it was a, a de-risk acquisition allowed me to move on to, you know, working on other things like micro -wire. So just depends on you as, as a founder. Now talk to us, uh, real quick about buying the cash on hand and the benefits of that, because that went a little over my, <laughs> my head. Yeah, that was, um, so that one was, um, uh, a kind of a, a, a creative, so we got to a price, um, and I wasn't happy with the price. And so, um, uh, and no, no founders have the price. Like we always want more, like, you know, and that's your time to negotiate. So I had a, a decision of negotiate on price or terms. And so 
I said, all right, I'll do this deal, but we have to do a stock sale because if you do an asset sale, you're taxed at 40%. And with a stock sale, you're taxed at um, 20% uh, long-term capital gains plus state tax. Um, we also qualified for something called um, QSBS, which is Qualified Small Business Tax Exemption. Look it up. Um, if you hold, uh, if you're a C Corp and you hold stock in your business for five years, you can be fully exempt from federal taxes. So I paid 13% on up to the first 10 million in, um, of the proceeds of the acquisition. And then we stacked the 2 million that we had on hand. So the usual route would be during an acquisition, once the deal closes, that money is dispersed to all shareholders at 40% tax. So, and since we put it on top of the purchase price, where they bought the business with the cash in the business, instead of dividending it out at 40%, we were taxed at 13%, just state tax. But if we lived in like Texas, it'd be zero. Definitely. That's why I moved to Texas. <laughs> yeah. See, I mean, I, if I was in Texas, I would have a little bit more change. Definitely. Now, um, you know, for founders here looking to buy businesses, right? Um, you know, you're out of ideas. You want to buy a business that's that product market fit. What are some ways to identify the perfect business to buy? And then how could they finance an acquisition using something like an SBA loan or, or any sort of financing mechanism instrument? Yeah, definitely. So I would, again, find if it's your first acquisition, find something small. Like something that just kind of feels like a pet project Um, because acquisitions, you know, I don't want to give the sense that they're super easy and that everything's going to go smoothly. You have legal, you have due diligence, you have transfer of assets, um, you have post acquisition um, strategies, like, like when you get the business, is it going to fall apart? So don't swing big on your first one. Like just go through the motions of like, okay, this is how an acquisition is done. So I'd recommend starting small and then really just finding out like where you feel like you can add the most value. So if you're looking, like if you're a larger buyer, you're looking for businesses that, you know, you can add an operator and you're the owner and someone else is growing it. But if, you're not at that point and you're looking to buy a business for like one to two to $3 million, you're essentially buying a job. So you're going to be running the business. So you're going to want to buy a business that you see growth opportunities. Maybe you're really good at marketing. Maybe you're really good at direct sales and they've never really explored or invested in those areas. That's where I would look. And then it has to align with kind of like your passion is it an industry you understand an industry that you have some sort of, you know, competitive advantage. Um, that's the, the best place to start. And the three things I always recommend looking at is um, churn, because you don't want to buy a business with just a leaky bucket of customers that are just canceling left and right. Um, you want to look at uh, customer reviews, like read a ton of customer reviews, talk to a ton of customers. And you want to look at the code too. You want to have a technical partner that can look through the code who wrote it? Is it clean? Is it outdated? Like, how is it going to be maintained moving forward? Just in case you acquire a company and there's like a bug or the servers go down, like someone needs to be available to fix that stuff. Um, in terms of financing, there's a number of different options like pipe, um, e-commerce lending is another good one. Um, SBA loans, SBA loans. I'm not an expert in SBA, SBA loans, but, um, they've been quoted as kind of like the, the cheat code to American um, capitalism, because you can get these loans at, at a really favorable interest rate and allows you to acquire a, a sizable business. For example, a business like, you know, 5 million doing, you know, 500,000 in profit. And so immediately upon acquiring that business, you are now making 500,000 a year. And so if you're able to grow that business and increase profitability or increase like um, the revenue it's bringing in and then service that debt as you're growing it, um, that can be a a huge advantage. But the downsides on SBA loans is they do require a personal guarantee. So um, just, you know, take caution with that. You know, you're essentially taking out a loan where 
you buy a SaaS company, it can go to zero if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so you want to make sure you have a good plan in place. You know, you have a target of like, this is kind of what I want to buy. Um, and then a, applying for SBA loans can be a very cumbersome process. And that's another thing we're trying to improve um, at business apps is, or excuse me, microquire, um, my current company, not my old one, um, is making it easier to get those loans because the, the way you get them now is you got to go to a bank, you got to present the opportunity. Um, it just, SBA loans haven't caught up to, um, you know, startup acquisitions. SBA loans are generally used to buy like a restaurant or laundry mat or something like that. So um, that's something that we're working with, um, you know, different banks in terms of educating them on, you know, these are the businesses, these are good ones, which fits your profile. Um, but there's also a pretty good article on um, microquire that we wrote on like how to search for an SBA loan, how to apply for one, things to look out for, all that fun stuff. Awesome. Now, is it Pipe or Capchase better routes you're saying? And I've come across Sterling Bank, which has very favorable interest rates as well. Are, are, they, are they better than themselves? Is the better, the are they better than, like, are they good options to finance an acquisition, I guess? Yeah, I would, it just depends on where you are. So if you're a startup and you go to, say, Pipe, what they'll do, and again, I don't work at Pipe, so I can't give like, this is exactly how it work, works, but um, they'll look at your, let's say you have a SaaS startup doing, you know, 5 million in revenue, they'll advance 5 million in revenue for you to either grow your business or use that capital to acquire a business. And that could, and it's very quick and you can basically acquire a company within like a week with that capital. Um, the other routes uh, will be a little bit more affordable, but you have to go through some hoops. You might have to put up a personal guarantee. Um, and so they all have pros and cons. So I recommend researching all the options because if it's going to be like a large acquisition, just spend an extra like week of just like going over like, financing options because you know if it comes with a personal guarantee are you comfortable with that or would you rather go with maybe a higher um, price loan that's a little bit more quicker allows you to leverage your existing revenue from uh, your current startup um, so it just depends on where you're at in your entrepreneurial journey but um, I will say if you need a loan to buy a business outright meaning you have zero money to put down um, there, there really are not no options. Every option requires some sort of collateral, um, sort of, some sort of down payment. I'm um, just like buying a house. Um, very rare. Have I heard of people buying houses with a hundred percent mortgage? Yeah. Buying, buying a house, but uh, a SaaS business that can potentially grow significantly and also cash flow significantly more than a house. Exactly. Um, Definitely. Now, you know, as you look back at your journey, what was the lowest point in your life and how did you navigate that? Uh, uh, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know. I've been punched in the face a bunch of times. <laughs> um, I, I would say the Apple thing was pretty hard, um, but we had wrangled with Apple like a few times, like once in like 2013. Um, and then, uh, about a year prior before actually selling the business. Those are always pretty tough. Um, even just getting the business off the ground. Um, there was a point where I was the only person running business apps. I had three friends that joined the company and our initial plan was to cold call small businesses. And we started calling restaurants and we were like, what's your mobile app strategy? And they're like, what appetizer? What are you talking about? Um, so they all kind of went back to class and I just remember being in an office, like a very small office, like the size of this room, basically. Um, so that was like a point where I started doubting myself, like, is this a viable business? Um, so that's why I always say, believe in yourself when others, um, don't, because that's, you know, that's absolutely mandatory as a startup founder. It's it, startups are hard. There's no way around it. Um, and so now I've, I've just kind of learned to just enjoy the ups and downs. And the more you can learn to enjoy the, the whole process, the ups and the downs and kind of remain consistent, um, the better, but I can give you like a whole list of like times where it's like, oh my gosh, this happened, like key employee leaves, um, 
you know, uh, key customer leaves. Like I've, I've kind of seen it all. Um, but again, it's, it's all about persevering through. And, you know, that's really, you know, when you look at successful founders, they make it look easy, but in the background, like every founder has gone through, like they started with zero revenue. They started with zero customers. They started with zero funding. They started with everything that, you know, if you are thinking about launching a startup, they started with everything you have now, which is like nothing, but they persevered and they pushed through every, you know, challenge that came to them. So I would just say, um, yeah, I mean, I've been through, you know, some pretty tough times, but the key is just having a positive attitude and just, I, I always say every problem has a solution and uh, it always works out. I know that's kind of like fortune cookie advice, but um, you know, half of building a startup can be mental, you know, just being able to push through those hard times and believe in yourself. Definitely. Perseverance is key. One piece of unconventional advice that founders ignore, but shouldn't. And I feel I know what you're going to say. But go on. Um, I would say the importance of um, founder market fit. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, finding something that you truly, truly, truly love, because that's what's going to get you through, you know, the hard times. And that's what's going to make um, the whole journey just so much more enjoyable. Like if you wake up every day and you have a startup, or I guess another piece of advice would be um, when you think about a startup, you know, understand that you can build whatever you want. It can be, it can serve any customer you want. You can solve any problem you want. You can work with whoever you want. You can make it whatever you want, but somehow I know a lot of startup founders that build these companies and these jobs that they end up hating because, you know, they brought in the wrong investor or, you know, they scaled the company too quickly um, so just being like really like, you know, sometimes knowing when to, you know, really hit the gas pedal and knowing when to maybe pull off the gas pedal, but um, I don't know if any of that's unconventional, but um, uh, the theme I'm going for is, you know, the more you can do to optimize your happiness while you're building your startup, the more successful you're going to be. It's like putting the oxygen mask on yourself. If the founder is happy and mentally strong, the business will do well. A lot of people go on this sort of venture capital or fundraise or explosive growth path. And then you hit with the roadblocks when you're not ready to scale and, and you end up being miserable or you don't have conviction for the customer you're serving and the problem in the market. And you're also miserable. Eventually it turns into a job. Now you're very, very active on LinkedIn and Twitter. So your, your Twitter, your LinkedIn is just Andrew Gazdecki. Any other channels you're, you're active besides uh, LinkedIn just, and Twitter? Just LinkedIn, uh, Andrew Gazdecki, and then um, Twitter, A Gazdecki. And then um, if anyone has any questions, like I love connecting with entrepreneurs, startups, um, feel free to shoot me an email, Andrew at microquare.com. I'd be happy to um, help out any way I can. Definitely. And I dropped a link to your book, Micro Acquire, Built and Sold Startups. So um, any other books that you've read or that's formulated your journey? Uh, there's a really good book called um, Play Bigger. I have it sitting over here. Um, it's, it's a book about like um, brand creation, uh, category creation, storytelling, um, another good one is um, strategic entrepreneurialism. Like that's really a word, I guess, by John Fisher. And it's a book about how to build a company with the intention to sell. And the premise of the book is kind of like building a puzzle piece that would fit into a larger strategic, you know, acquire. What um, is the name of that book again? Uh, strategic entrepreneurialism uh, by John Fisher. J O N uh, Fisher. F I S C A G R something like that. It's a, it, 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 it's a small read that like um, not a lot of people have, have heard about, but another good one uh, tuned in. Um, I'm a big advocate of talking to customers tuned in is like a framework on like how to, you know, talk to customers in a way where you're getting the feedback you need to hear and not what you want to hear. Um, 
and then uh, from impossible to uh, from impossible to inevitable by Jason Lemkin and Aaron Ross. That's kind of uh, one of the best SaaS books on like starting, building a sales team, building a marketing strategy um, from end to end. I highly recommend that book too. Cool. And your email again is just Andrew at microacquire.com. Yeah. My personal email is uh, gmail at andrewgazdecki.com. Um, I thought that was funny to set up, but um, when you get on the bank and they're like gmail at andrewgazdecki.com, like, are you serious? Um, it's not that funny, but uh, yeah, either, either of those work. Awesome. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks, thanks for staying longer than we had planned. Wishing you great success, my friend. Love and peace. Yeah, thanks for saying so much for having me. And um, shout out to everyone that um, joined. Truly appreciate all of your support and uh, rooting for all of you. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. I need some traction.